This is a brief video on psychoactive drugs, including the pharmacology of these drugs, some symptoms of intoxication, symptoms of withdrawal, as well as treatments for some of the drugs. Before we begin, we have some images of these psychoactive drugs. Uh, this is a good image from Wikipedia that shows a lot of them that we're going to be talking about. So let's begin with the depressants and sedatives. This is the first category of psychoactive drugs. These include alcohol, barbiturates, and benzodiazepines. Mechanism of action for all of these is that they enhance the GABA receptor. Now remember that GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So if you enhance the inhibitory neurotransmitter, it's going to have a depressive or sedative effect. That's what happens when you have a couple drinks of alcohol. You're enhancing the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, which kind of inhibits you, which kind of puts you to sleep, which kind of sedates you. Symptoms of intoxication of these depressants are incoordination, ataxia, slurred speech, euphoria, nystagmus, impaired attention, inhibition of behavior, coma, and blackouts. <clears throat> it's worth noting that on the liver function tests, the AST is often twice the ALT with intoxication from these drugs. And uh, this is essentially being drunk. You have incoordination, you have ataxia, slurred speech. When somebody gets drunk, they present with the symptoms listed here. Some symptoms that might help you specify benzos or barbiturate intoxication include hypotension and respiratory depression. Now, in order to treat overdose or intoxication of benzodiazepines in particular, we can use flumazenil and uh, the other uh, intoxications, intoxications of barbiturates and alcohol would just be supportive treatments. Withdrawal of these drugs <clears throat> might include hallucinations, seizures, hypertension, nausea, sweating, insomnia, anxiety, agitation, and tremors. Now, if we specifically see muscle cramps, twitches, and tachycardia, we suspect a withdrawal from benzos and barbiturates. And finally, <clears throat> delirium tremens is a, uh, is, a, is a group of symptoms that we see 48, 72, sometimes 96 hours after the last drink, and that includes fluctuating consciousness, high heart rate, seizures, anxiety, and tremors. And that's a sign of withdrawal. That's like a serious sign of withdrawal. Um, it's important to note that these seizures can be fatal. Um, so we do want to treat delirium tremens if we see it. And oftentimes the symptom to, to differentiate delirium tremens from other withdrawal symptoms from the depressants is the fluctuating consciousness. Just because we're not sure uh, if, if it's actually DT, we would ask them, we would ask the patient if they ever remember kind of passing out or fading out or, or kind of graying out during their withdrawal period. So again, this can be fatal. The DTs, as they call them, delirium tremens, uh, are pretty serious withdrawal symptoms. Opioids are next. Opioids include heroin and a bunch of per prescription pain medications, like hydrocodone, like oxycodone. There's a long list of opioids, um, and heroin is another one that's not prescribed. Mechanism here are that they antagonize the opioid receptor, especially the mu opioid receptor. Intoxication by opioids show motor slowness, slurred speech, euphoria, impaired attention and sedation, meiosis, and respiratory depression. Treatment here is naloxone or naltrexone, both of which are opioid antagonists, which would antagonize the receptor that the opioids hit. Um, so they would kind of de detoxify you uh, from the opioid intoxication. Withdrawal symptoms are kind of the opposite of intoxication. Depression and anxiety, diarrhea, cramps, sweating, piloerection, pupillary dilation, yawning, and muscle aches. Uh, some symptoms that might help you differentiate these from other drug withdrawals are piloerection, pupillary dilation, and yawning. Um, those are pretty specific to this. Treatment for opioid withdrawal is mainly just supportive. You might want to give something for the pain, give something for the GI distress. Um, some drugs that might help are methadone and buprenorphine, which are weak agonists of opioids, and those can help. This is not a fatal withdrawal, so it's not as serious as withdrawal from alcohol or benzodiazepines. Heroin and oxycodone, it's worth mentioning, are the most widely abused opioids, and they're responsible for many deaths, and unfortunately that number is increasing as the opioid epidemic becomes more serious. 
Next, we have the stimulants. These include cocaine, amphetamines, methamphetamines, MDMA, which is ecstasy, and cathinone, which is bath salts. Also some mild ones, caffeine and nicotine. Mechanism of action depends on which ones you're looking at. Cocaine blocks the norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake, thus increasing their effectiveness in the synapses. Amphetamine increases the synaptic activities, the synaptic concentrations of norepinephrine and dopamine, so similar to cocaine. Nicotine agonizes the cholinergic receptors in the in the peripheral and the central nervous system. Um, that's uh, there's a, there's a nicotinic receptor, a nicotinic cholinergic receptor, um, hence nicotine, nicotinic receptor. Caffeine enhances the effects of dopamine by blocking adenosine receptors. So it doesn't directly affect dopamine. Um, it blocks adenosine receptors, which in turn enhances dopamine's effect. Intoxication of stimulants kind of varies depending on what you're taking, but for amphetamines, you have grandoise behavior, euphoria, hypervigilance, paranoia, agitation. You also have some autonomic increases. You have increases in blood pressure, heart rate, some chills, sweating, and nausea and vomiting. Cocaine essentially adds to that list. Um, you have a tactile hallucination of bugs on your skin, so you might see people itching themselves or picking at their skin. Treatment for intoxication of these substances is pretty much supportive. Lorazepam for anxiety, haloperidol for psychosis. You also want to monitor their vitals, make sure that their heart rate doesn't go too high, their blood pressure doesn't go through the roof. Withdrawal of these symptoms depends again on the drugs. Amphetamines and cocaine um, might have you increase your appetite since one of the effects of cocaine and amphetamines are to decrease your appetite. Withdrawal would be increasing your appetite. This is kind of the opposite. Uh, you would have a low heart rate. You would have depression, fatigue. So obviously you're withdrawing from a stimulant. You're going to be tired. You're going to be low. Uh, nicotine withdrawal also shows appetite, low heart rate, dysphoria. Somebody might get anxious. Uh, they might get irritable. So think of taking away cigarettes from somebody who depends on cigarettes. They're going to be irritable. Caffeine has mild withdrawal symptoms. You can get headaches. You can get a little dysphoria. That's, that's really, really mild. Um, a little bit of anxiety. Somebody who has several cups of coffee a day, if you stop them getting coffee, they might get headaches. And treatment of these withdrawal symptoms is pretty much supportive. Cannabinoids. This is We're pretty much talking about marijuana here. There's a couple others, hashish and synthetic blends like K2 and spice. The mechanism of action is uh, THC is the, is the, is the main chemical, the, the active ingredient, and that binds, binds to the cannabinoid receptor, which, in, which inhibits adenylate cyclase and CAMP production. So intoxication presents with symptoms of conjunctivitis, which is the red eyes that you see, uh, the dry mouth, high blood pressure, high heart rate, increased appetite, euphoria, hallucination at high doses, and also agitation. Um, so again, conjunctivitis is probably the, the big differentiating symptom that, that you would have for cannabinoids. Um, treatment here is kind of supportive. Lorazepam for, agi uh, for, for, for agitation. That's a, that's a benzo just to reduce agitation, reduce anxiety. Withdrawal shows irritability, agitation, insomnia, and nausea. Treatment is supportive for there as well. There's no, there's no real risk for cannabinoid withdrawal. So supportive treatment, not fatal. Social implications, these are a little iffy. These, these, we're not sure if they're true, but there might be something they call amotivational syndrome, uh, which is where overuse of cannabinoids, chronic use of cannabinoids, kind of reduce your motivation to go out and do things, kind of make you lazy, kind of make you want to sit at home. Um, there's, there's not really good scientific evidence to support that, um, but it's like a trend that people have seen, so I, I threw it in there. People also say it's a gateway drug. Also, not the best scientific evidence for that, um, but it's a maybe. It's a maybe. Um, so physiologic changes that you definitely do see are lower testosterone in men, uh, decreased ovulation in females, lower birth weights, and also increased neonatal malformations. This is with chronic use of cannabinoids. And the medical form of cannabinoids called dronabinol is used as a supportive medication in addition to chemotherapies and in addition to AIDS for the purposes of antiemetic to prevent vomiting in chemo and to stimulate appetite in AIDS patients. Next are hallucinogens, pretty much talking about LSD here, which is also called acid. There's also psilocybin, which is the active ingredient in mushrooms or uh, psychedelic mushrooms. And uh, peyote is like, a, is, like, is like a cactus that has the active ingredient mescaline, um, and that's also a hallucinogen. Mechanism of action here is that LSD activates the serotonin receptors in the limbic system, the neocortex, and the brainstem. Intoxication of hallucinogens are that you obviously get hallucinations. You might also see delusions or midriasis, which is dilation 
of the pupils. You uh, get tachycardia, high heart rate, sweating, ataxia, and tremors. Um, if you take the magic mushrooms, you might also get euphoria and paranoia in addition to those listed above. Um, LSD might also give you psychosis and flashbacks in addition to those listed above. Treatment for these are mainly supportive again. Uh, lorazepam, which is for agitation, that's just a benzo, kind of reduce the anxiety, reduce the agitation. Haloperidol might help with the psychoses. That's an antipsychotic drug. There is no withdrawal from hallucination, so you don't need to worry about that. Dissociatives. The main one here is PCP. Uh, another one is ketamine. So mechanism of action for these are that they block the glutamate NMDA receptor. And ketamine is used in the clinic, actually, as an anesthetic. And it's it also blocks the NMDA receptor. It's an NMDA antagonist. So intoxication of dissociatives. Um, you feel dissociated from your body. You feel separated from your body. You might also get hallucinations. You get impulsivity. Uh, you reduce pain, analgesic effect. Oftentimes, these people become violent. Um, there's high blood pressure, high heart rate, meiosis involved here, which is small pupils, pupil constriction, nystagmus, delusions, and seizures. Treatment here is supportive for intoxication. Just help them out through it. Um, you might want to give benzodiazepines and antipsychotics to reduce the anxiety, to reduce the psychosis if somebody's on PC or PCP. And for uh, these, you also want to monitor for serotonin syndrome because they both uh, can, can increase the levels of serotonin in the body. Now, withdrawal isn't very serious for dissociatives. Don't have to worry about that. And lastly, we're going to talk about these anti-addiction medications, these treatment of addiction for some of these medications. So throughout this, we kind of talked about some drugs you would give to reduce intoxication or some drugs that you would give to help with withdrawal. These include some of those and more. Um, these are anti-addiction, treatment of addiction medications. So for alcohol addiction, you can give disulfiram, which blocks an enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase, um, essentially increases the levels of acetaldehyde in the body. A campersate, which is an analog of GABA, remember that um, alcohol increased the effects of the GABA uh, receptor. So if you give an analog of GABA, it kind of yeah, it kind, of, kind of gives you the same effect. It can be used in the treatment of addiction. Um, and a campersate's mechanism of action is kind of unknown, but um, it's also an NMDA receptor antagonist. Naltrexone is another one. That's an opioid antagonist. And you might be wondering, why would the opioid pathways relate to the alcohol addiction pathways? And it's just that there are endogenous opioid pathways that play a role um, in the pathway that leads to alcohol addiction. So uh, kind of antagonizing that opioid receptor can help reduce the addiction, reduce the, the dependence on alcohol. So now let's talk about opioid addiction. Again, we see naltrexone, which is an opioid antagonist, can help people get over that, that dependence. There's a combo drug of buprenorphine and naltrexone, which is a combination of an opioid partial agonist and an opioid antagonist. This is a, a drug that's administered sublingually. It's a tablet you put under the tongue. And it's really kind of brilliant because the, the combination has worked so that if you swallow the pill, it doesn't give you any good effect. And if you crush it up and inject the pill, it actually gives you a negative effect. It, um, crushing up and injecting the pill gives you the effect of the opioid antagonist, which would make your withdrawal worse, which would make uh, your symptoms worse. It makes you feel awful. So the way that this drug has been designed, the buprenorphine-naltrexone combo, is that you have to administer it sublingually for it to work. And that allows people to give a drug for opioid addiction that people cannot abuse. It's a pretty, pretty good combination. Nicotine addiction. We have a couple here. Bupropion increases the norepinephrine and dopamine concentrations. Um, this is also an antidepressant, but it helps uh, get over nicotine addiction. We have varenicline, which is a partial nicotinic agonist. It kind of has the effect of nicotine, and it kind of acts as a, as, a, as a substitute for nicotine from cigarettes in people who are trying to break that addiction. That's all we have for today. I hope this video on psychoactive drugs was helpful. Thank you for listening.